Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying late for us. Uh, when preparing, we were actually like joking and uh, thinking whether anyone would stay and expect that we will be selling Google Cloud. We will not be selling Google Cloud today. So uh, while preparing to uh, this whole talk, we were thinking like, how do we do this relevant boss for Python community and how do we do it not about whatever generic infrastructure? And the idea that came to mind was to build a talk around uh, obviously machine learning and some of the big data. And we didn't know back then that the whole conference will be much about TensorFlow machine learning even without us. So my name is uh, Dmitry Nowakowski. I'm a sales engineer at uh, Google Cloud in Amsterdam. Uh, we're presenting together with Lee today. So uh, the talk that we are doing will be, as I mentioned, about machine learning APIs at Google Cloud and also about tiny bit of data processing and integrating it with machine learning as, as well. The whole goal is to uh, obviously show, show you guys what we got uh, and also help you understand how to leverage some of the things that are already out there so that you would know now that you don't have to build your own machine learning model, for example, to do image recognition or you don't have to build your own machine learning to do translations. Many people have already done it. OK, where is the next button? Yeah, so um, uh, real quick, the agenda. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Python and Google. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about Google for Python. That's where we'll st we will start about Google Cloud. Uh, then Lee will do an extension extensive session about uh, machine learning uh, for those few of those <laughs> who might not yet know what uh, machine learning is and how to apply it. And then we will do some demos and architecture walkthroughs to show you actual solutions that we've built or we are, we've been building for the customers, for the demo purposes, and so on. So Python at Google. We really wanted to have this slide. That's like a Python conference. Show some love. So uh, I don't think that will, this will come like some sort of the news, but uh, Python is widely adopted at Google. It's recognized as one of the official languages. Uh, when I was interviewing for the position, Python was part of the interview. It was given me the choice, and I was like, OK, let's do Python. It's uh, recognized as one of the official languages. Uh, it's been widely used both internally and externally for the products that we built. And uh, it's also been supported. So PyCons, all, all the other conferences, and including the one that we're all in right now, Google is extensively sponsoring it and being represented by uh, Googlers, Py contributors, and just by people who like to talk and do Python. So a few examples uh, from the Python perspective, like uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's integral to many of the Google products, um, to many of the Google products that are being offered today. It's widely used on YouTube for uh, in the parts of the video playback and the parts of where you work with the templates. Uh, the App Engine product that oh sorry. The App Engine product that uh, has been like a conception of Google Cloud many, many years ago, the platform as a service product where you could ru run your apps uh, in the cloud without taking care of the infrastructure. The first language that, they, that it actually supported was Python. Um, and uh, most of the things that you can find in terms of Google APIs, that you can find in terms of the clients for Google APIs, they always have the support for Python. So that's the first class citizen from the Google perspective. Also, as you see on the right, broadly used internally. So uh, build systems, report generation, log analysis. Many people at Google like to use Python for it for all the obvious reasons. The more interesting question is, as uh, someone who is developing on Python, who is running a Python project, what can you consume from Google? What, how can Google help, help you with this? And yeah, the answer for it is uh, Google Cloud Platform. So that's uh, where me and Lee are coming from, from uh, the jobs that we're doing on a daily basis. Uh, Google Cloud Platform is Google's offering of uh, all the products and the services that we're, we've been building internally for our, own, uh, for our own, own purposes, for other people to be leveraged the same, uh, to be able to leverage the same technology. That's the worst slide I have ever built, so don't try to memorize it. Uh, the point of it is to show that uh, Google Cloud spans across compute infrastructure, so you can run virtual machines, you can run platform as a service, you can run containers, uh, big data storage, and machine learning. Today we'll focus specifically on some of the big data parts and a lot of the machine learning. So these are the products and the APIs that are very easy to start consuming and start, uh, start making your apps smarter. 
Uh, so th here on this example, just uh, let's take a look. Let's say I'm, a building, I'm building a Python application. So how can I leverage Google Cloud? How can I benefit from it and make it run faster, make it run more intelligent? So on the top, obviously, a couple of the examples that I can run it on the Google Cloud in virtual machine in container, as I mentioned. Uh, the more interesting part is on the left and on the right. So uh, the part on the left for you, yeah, for me it's also on the left, uh, is being able to embed certain intelligence into your application. So uh, after today's conference, probably everyone knows about TensorFlow and machine learning, at least a little bit. But what's more interesting, and that will be the premise of uh, the demo that Lee will be doing, is being able to do machine learning without learning machine learning. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, recognize the images, translate the text, uh, recognize the sentiment within the text just by querying a simple API and providing your inputs over there. Google provides multiple pre-trained models based on the whole set of data that we were able to use, which you can just directly integrate into the Python application and start using without actually knowing machine learning. Um, on the right side, well, everyone knows the term serverless today. Uh, what's also interesting and important and very useful for pretty much any average project is being able to uh, process the data and store the data very efficiently, very easily, uh, without taking care of the infrastructure. So the examples that I will be walking through will be around the service called Cloud Dataflow, which allows you to run uh, MapReduce-like operations, highly parallel, highly distributed, highly scalable, without having to run Hadoop cluster anywhere. Um, with this in mind, yeah. Two examples that we will show today, as I mentioned, will be around machine learning and around highly scalable data processing with the, the, with the machine learning embedded at the very end. So with this in mind, I will hand over to Lee right now to do the walkthrough on the machine learning suite that we are doing. All right, thank you, Dimitri. <laughs> so machine learning, and I, I heard, as I've seen a lot of uh, presentations today as about machine learning, so I guess we today already know a little bit what machine learning is or what it stands for. Um, but I'd like to explain it one more time, and I would like to do it like a very simple way, because yeah, I know it's a bit late now, and we're all ready for some beer, so I'm going to explain it very easily. Um, imagine that you want to teach something to a kid. Uh, you want to say, like, you learn a kid, what is a car, and what's the difference, what, what, is, a, what is a bike? What you would do is you would just point many times to your kid, like here, this is a car, has four wheels, it's on the road. That is a bike, has two wheels, and it has a seat, and uh, it's also on the road, that's a bike. And when you do that like many, many times to a kid, then a kid will remember like, okay, that's a car, that's a bike, maybe if the roof is a bit higher, it's not a car, it's a bus. That same way it's like uh, with machine learning uh, and computers, but, um, Data scientists, they create a model, and in that model, yeah, they, I mean, that, that these are really data scientists, they, they created that model, and they can do that with uh, tools like TensorFlow. Um, but the, the thing is, like, once we shoot in lots and lots of data, then the computer will start recognizing patterns. And that's, it's, that's kind of similar, like, that way. Uh, many people always ask me, like, okay, so machine learning, is that the same as uh, artificial intelligence? And that's actually not exactly the same, because artificial intelligence, or AI, that's about the process of building smarter computer software, or computers. Um, so think about writing down like if-else statements. And the thing is, with, with AI, it's, there is always a reason, or there's always a way how you can break that. Well, with machine learning, that's more the process of uh, making a computer learn. So let, let a computer learn by himself. And, um, there's this observation that we did, and it is actually, it is uh, much easier to let a computer learn than to really manually build uh, software that is smart. Now let's take a look into this example. We see here uh, a dog and a mob. Now, um, to recognize both, I think that is a simple example, right? It must be easy, or not. <laughs> So here we see on this on this image you see, or on this slide we see like lots and lots of dogs and sheep dogs and also some mobs and, and we actually need machine learning to really figure out like which one is the real dog and uh, which one is the, the mob. Now the way how you can do that with machine learning is you can just yeah, give it a, a picture of a dog and then you let machine learning uh, predict or detect what, what it in fact is like classifying it and uh, in this case it says like yeah it's a dog it's uh, I'm 
99% confident that it is a dog. Um, but I'm not really confident if it's really a crossbreed, as you can see on the bottom. You see that it's only at uh, 51%. Now, if we would feed much more data, then maybe the confidence level would be a bit higher. So that is what machine learning is. Um, it, it's based, uh, or it works with neural networks, that, that the idea is inspired by how our brains work. Um, so we have like many parts in the, in the brain, and they can all yeah, uh, classify things. Um, for, for an image, let's say that we have an image from a, from a dog, uh, what you can do is you just look into, on pixel level, on little smaller pieces of the image, and you can say like, okay, this is, the, uh, this is a tail, uh, this is probably a dog, this is a fur, it's probably a dog, and it goes through all these levels till at the end, and then it's like more sure, like, okay, it's, it's definitely a dog, it's not, uh, not a mob. Why is machine learning now so popular? Um, if we look into it, like last year we had the Google I.O. Uh, conference and our CEO uh, Sundar, he came on stage and he said like, since today, as last year, we no longer build uh, mobile first applications, no, we build AI first applications. So mobile first, eh, that was uh, for many years the, the way how, how Google or how everybody or many developers created apps where we always were focused on uh, mobile phones. We say like if your app application runs on a mobile phone, then it probably runs on any type of device. Now, after all these years, we all collected so much data through apps, but also through sensors, um, that we now can finally do some predictions and, and, and do something with this data. So we have much more data. The, the amount of data has been grown over the years. Uh, we now have the knowledge of creating better models, and we also yeah, have the computing power for all these um, models. And you can imagine that um, if you want to train a model and it takes you 50 hours uh, on your own machine, if you run that same job somewhere in the cloud, you can just hire 50 computers. And then it doesn't take 50 hours. No, then it takes only one hour. And if you multiply that by 60, your, your task or your training uh, job only takes a minute and so on. So that is the reason why this is the time that, that everybody is really focused on uh, yeah, machine learning. Why are many people thinking about Google when they're talking about machine learning? Well, that is because um, Google created the, the Tensor, or Google has the TensorFlow uh, framework, which is open source. It is my, uh, one of the most popular frameworks on GitHub with a 53K uh, star rating and uh, 480 contributions. It's a Python framework, so um, definitely that is a, one of the reasons why many people think of Google. Yeah, the other reason why people think about it is because Google has like lots of. Um, all right, this. Yep. Uh, Google has this hardware, so you can decide like, oh, I run my mach my machine learning on my own on my own machine, and that is fine. But you can also decide to run it on uh, Google's machines and do it the way how Google does it. So that is on the one, uh, one end. And then, then we're talking really about training models and running, making your own uh, machine learning. Uh, what you see on the right side, these are the pre-trained models. And they are trained by Google. And this, this is how I call it. I call it the friendly way of doing machine learning. Because I don't know about you. Maybe you guys are all data scientists. But I'm not. I'm just a developer. And yeah. I, I like just to do things quickly and to not think about it. And that is what's really nice about our machine learning APIs, because it's basically what you do is just making a REST call, and you get some data back. So you can feed it with an image, for example, and uh, you get the machine learning back from Google right away in real time. And here you see an example. This is actually was, this is the translation application where we uh, point our camera on, on a sign, which is in Russian, right, Dmitry? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it tells you what, what it stands for. And this is, was actually in the translation app. But uh, earlier this week, Google also introduced the, the Google Lens. So now this, fun uh, this feature will be actually integrated in, yeah, in, the, yeah, in the Google Assistant and, and more on the operation uh, system. and. The, of Google Photos and so. So it's actually like the Shazam, but done in real world. Yeah. So let's take a look into all these uh, APIs that Google has, because the previous example, that is something that you could build with the Vision API. 
And a vision API, again, it's just um, a REST call that you make. You feed it with a picture. This picture, you can upload that picture, or you can just put that picture somewhere in a cloud storage bucket. And then it's somewhere in a data center from Google. And um, yeah, Google can detect all kinds of things based on that image. So we can detect um, landmarks. We can detect logos. We can do OCR text, so we can read the text out of the image. Uh, we can also do some facial uh, sentiment uh, analysis based on, on the photo, and then detect where the face is. Um, we could also detect who's on the picture, but because of privacy reasons, we're not giving that away. So that's definitely not possible in the, uh, with the APIs. But we do can detect the, 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 the face and say, like, oh, it's a happy face. Is it sad face? Um, yeah, where's a hat? And um, we can also flag images uh, on inappropriate content. This is actually something that Google does on their own pages. Uh, for example, on YouTube, we probably do something similar when people uh, upload inappropriate videos. We can immediately detect that and yeah, send an alarm bus or just make sure that the upload gets canceled. Uh, lately, Vision API has an update. We now also have support for web entities. Really, really cool. I will show you that later. Um, it can detect where the image uh, was yeah, is uploaded uh, anywhere else on the web, and it can give you the URL. So maybe for copyright reasons, that is nice, but it's also nice because you can get some extra information out of the picture based on yeah, what other websites write. Let me give you one example. Uh, or I have like two nice examples about Vision API. Uh, one of our customers, that's uh, Disney, they created uh, for the movie Pete's Dragon, they created a funny game. It was actually for kids. Uh, kids, they can run the game, and in the game you would get a quest on your phone, and it would say, like, uh, make a picture of a couch or, or a chair. And when a kid would point the camera on the chair, and it will detect that it's indeed a chair, then you would see, like, a dragon sitting on the chair. I think that that's funny, and you could totally do that with Vision uh, API, because you could detect, like, oh, it's, if it's indeed a chair, OK, then we put the dragon on top of it. Um, another use case is like uh, real estate companies. Then there are various companies they created that way that if you make a picture of a for sale sign, then suddenly, based on the OCR the, uh, detection, it will uh, find the website with the correct house listing and show you exactly the price of the house. So. Oh, but, and I was just thinking the other day, like I believe like the Netherlands also had some app like that with cars, I believe. So I think you could totally create that with the, with the Vision API if, if, if you're interested in doing that. Speech API. So that is like we have take audio files or audio that can be streaming audio that you speak in real time, or that can be that you upload an audio file, and we write out the transcript. So we write out the text for you. Um, we have support for over 80 languages. And um, yeah, what you see people doing is writing out, uh, yeah, sub or writing subtitles, for example, for, for, um, yeah, for videos or something that they do with that. Uh, the speech API has often been used with the natural language API and also with the translation API. The natural language API can really understand the text that is written. So you pass in some text, and then it can understand the, yeah, the text. It can see the, the nouns, the, the, the verbs. Uh, it recognizes it based on the way how it was written. You can also detect the sentiment out of that. So you can see if it's a positive message or a negative message. Um, it has also multi-language support. Now, a use case for this, and it has actually, I was like brainstorming uh, with, with uh, somebody from KPN the other day about it. I think a real good re uh, use case for this would be like, um, imagine like uh, there's a help desk and somebody calls angry on the phone, like, yeah, my internet is not working. Um, when that, when that, when that uh, conversation is very negative, you can, for example, with the speech API, write it all out, and then you can detect the sentiment. Uh, so if, if you indeed detect, like, OK, this is, the, the client is really angry. I mean, you could, for example, uh, send a message to your supervisor that the supervisor or his boss uh, jumps in the, in, the, in the call and, and listens and see what, what's going wrong. That will be a great use case. Uh, translation API, uh, that's just uh, real-time subtitles. We, we use that also on, on YouTube for that. Oh. I, I hope it stays there, and uh, we'll see. Yes, great. 
<laughs> yeah, translation API, it can detect, uh, you feed it with text, and it automatically detects the, the, the language that was passed in, and then, yeah, it, it translates it. I believe we have more than 100 languages uh, support for that, and we actually recently had a um, revision, uh, like a newer version of the translation API, which is actually really great. Previously, when we did Google Translation or Google Translate, we would do it based on dictionaries. We would just literally like, look in dictionaries for the words. And nowadays, we use machine learning to create translation machine learning. Um, what we actually do is we, we really try to understand the text and see the way how words are written and in which way, in which order. Uh, so for example, if you look here on the, on the, on the left, you see this, this is text, a Spanish text. It's uh, actually a, a paragraph from the, the Harry Potter books. In the first uh, generation of translation, we would literally translate that, and you would get things like fence of the gardens, while in the newer version, it would really translate it like uh, it's a garden fence. And in the previous version, we did not know the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the word before that, the proverb. Um, now we know it's indeed her. It's not there, it's her. I mean, that is based on machine learning. Based, it starts to understand the context. It, it knows the context, so it can provide you better, uh, better translation. And then the last one, uh, also a really nice one. This is a video intelligence API. You feed it with a video. This can be a video that was uploaded in uh, cloud storage. And then it will detect everything that's on the video. So it can see, like, for example, if I show a video of a dog, then it knows, it will see, like, it's a dog. And it will also tell me on what keyframe that dog appeared and uh, if it, what kind of shot it was taken. This is not the exact same as the Vision API. That was my suggestion first. I thought, like, oh, this is just a, vi a Vision API, but now with every, every shot or every uh, frame uh, as a video, no. Uh, no. It is, it, well, if in the beginning it does that, it just analyzes every frame, but it also tries to understand the total co uh, context of the video. So at the end, it does some extra processing there. Um, yeah, again, this is, these are all just REST calls that you make uh, on pre uh, trained models. Here you see an example of the, the response that you could get back from the video API. So it tells you, like, oh, in this shot or in this frame, I see a portrait and um, it tells me uh, that so on the, the frame, the segment information. This is actually uh, microseconds, where it tells me uh, yeah, where that portrait actually appeared. And then also the confidence, like the, how sure it is that it is indeed a portrait. Now, I created some demos with that, but because I thought, like, oh, this is actually pretty cool, and since this is a Python uh, conference, I can write some, some cool um, Python uh, code for this. I, let me. Um, Show you one more thing. Right, well, I'll show it you here. So first of all, what you would do is you would go to the Google Cloud uh, uh, the, the, yeah, console, and you need an account for this. Uh, accounts are free, so you can just create an account, and uh, you get like uh, a lot of like for three hundred dollar on credits on it. So that is enough uh, time and. Uh, machine learning playtime. And then once you're locked into the GCP console, then you need to enable all the APIs. So in my case, because I'm showing you, I will show you an example of the Vision API and the Translate API and the Video API. So I need to enable those three uh, yeah, APIs. Since my application is uh, running on my local machine, I need to install the Google Cloud console. Um, the command line tools that is, uh, yeah, it's just an executable or, uh, yeah, you install that and then you have the access over the, the Google Cloud uh, interface and then all the tools uh, to upload your, um, your, your code, but also just to do like, um, you know, all kind of little things like debugging or, or checking or logging. Then you download uh, the, the Python pip package. So you just say pip install uh, and then uh, Google Cloud. And you get the, the Python code uh, for actually creating a demo like this. I'm telling you exactly all the steps that I did. So you could basically try it out yourself at home. Uh, there are great documentations for it. So uh, definitely uh, have a look into that. 
Now uh, let me show the demo. So I created uh, just a simple Flask website uh, where I can uh, point to an image or I can point to a video API. Now, I could create it that way that you upload an, an image or a video, but because we're here on a conference and I just don't, didn't know about the network speed, so I already uploaded it myself in a, in a cloud storage bucket. And now I just point it by passing in a, a GS path. And I did it. I did that first with, uh, with a, uh, a picture of a famous Groninger person. I think we all know who this is. Um, so it, it, it detects the image, it detects the colors of the image. Let me see if I can make it a bit bigger. Yeah. So it, it, it tells me exactly which colors it sees that in the image. And then it gives me back labels. And I already translated the labels because the, in the first place it uh, comes back in English. I translated it back to Dutch. And it tells me, okay, this is a spaler, probably literally translated player. And he's like 49% sure. Uh, it also sees that it's a, a, a soccer player, or it has something to do with sports. It's not really sure. It could be a tennis player. Yeah, it's a bald guy. Uh, many tennis players are bald. So <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and something to do with championship, uh, champions um, league. Now, it probably has to do because it sees like the big uh, um, the cup here. Now. Um, then it also found some web entities online. And based, I mean, this Google is not telling you that this is Arden Robin, but the web does tell me that because there are many websites uh, that are uh, posting this picture online. And based on that, I can de definitely detect the labels and I can see how oh, it's Arden Robin. Has something to do with FIFA World Cup. Uh, it could be 2014, but it could also be 2010. It detects some text. So let's take a look back into the image. Well, it found out the copyright uh, in the image, but it also uh, saw some text in his clothes. So that's actually uh, funny too. And then uh, some stuff about facial recognition. Uh, so it did give me, actually, I did not print it here, but it did give me the coordinate. And it says he's very happy, obviously, because he has a big cup. Um, yeah, and he's not wearing a hat. Now, I did this same demo again, but now with, uh, with a landmark, with a vision, a, uh, vision API. So we all know this tower. And again, it gave me the colors back. This time, I thought, like, because it gave me back the latitude and longitude. So um, I thought, like, you know what? I'm going to plot that on a, on a Google map. And uh, actually, let's take a look. I made that Google map in the colors of the the colors of the image, because that, I thought that's a funny gimmick. Now let's take a look where it, uh, in fact, is uh, located. Now it looks like the internet is not really working with me, but yeah, I mean, we can see here, oh, it's coming. We can see like it, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, Groningen in the binnenstad, so I assume that that, that is correct. And you see here the labels, uh, Melpau, I think that's probably landmark translated from English. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does, does see that it is like a building and it has something to do with a tower and a church. And it found entities online, it's actually the Martini Tower. Uh, yeah, Martini Kerk. White. Now, the last demo that I did. Um, the last demo that I did was I uh, uploaded a video, and it's actually a nice video of an animation. So these are not real uh, animals, but it, it's a nice uh, video. It's actually one of the free um, yeah, um, MP4 demo, uh, videos, I guess. And it, it came back with some uh, labels. It tells me I see an animal, and I'm like 80% sure of that. And then it also gives me back all the seconds where that animal actually appeared. So let's... Um, it's not, uh, it's not fast, so we'll see. You have to trust me. I can uh, also share the code later on GitHub with you, so you can try it out. But what I did thought it was funny, it also thought, like, well, I'm 50% confidence that I see an ape. And then I look at this animal, it's some kind of bunny, but it's probably because it's so big and furry that it could be also a gorilla, I guess. So that's probably where that, the, that suggestion came from. I don't know. Yes. Now, how did I create that? Um, 
Now let's dive into the code. Uh, like I said, this is just a simple Flask application. Uh, I could host it uh, in App Engine in Flex. I could also uh, host it in uh, the standard. Uh, this time I'm not hosting anything because I prefer to run it from my local machine. Um, but if I would host it, it takes the GUnicorn um, way to serve it. And um, I chose a Python 2.7, but you can use 3 as well. That's uh, not a big deal. Now let's take a look into my views.py code. You see, I, uh, first of all, I am, um, let me close this. I, um, I created uh, like a code file, my manager, with the vision the API code, uh, the translate code, and also the video uh, code. And then I created a bunch of routes. Here is nothing special yet. It just takes the, I, I created three routes. The first route is the index page with the two forms. And then I created two more routes for uh, the one for the vision API and one for the video. Um, so I take the value that was passed in from the form. In this case, it is uh, yeah, a storage bucket. I get that uh, image and I pass that to my manager and I do that for both, for vision and for um, the video. Sorry, this is where the magic finally comes. Um, it's actually just google.cloud and that, that's where most of the magic happens. Uh, video intelligence API, by the time of writing, it's still in beta. So that is why I'm loading it a different way from just uh, one of the packages from our engineers. But eventually, it will be all part of this uh, Google Cloud package, and you can start playing around with that. You can see that I did some stuff with um, service accounts, keys. This is just to whitelist my local machine to make sure that machine learning also runs locally. Uh, if you would deploy it in the Google Cloud, in App Engine, or in a container engine, or wherever, um, then it will automatically whitelist your app anyway. So then you don't need to deal with that. Uh, yep. So here comes my code, the, the vision manager that was the, the most code that I wrote for because yeah, the vision API can definitely detect the most because you can see it can detect landmarks, logos, labels, uh, faces, text, colors, and, and web entities. So I created some, some methods here, but this is actually the magic. I say image.detect landmarks, and that gives me back uh, a number of landmarks. And same is for, for labels. Although you can see what I'm doing is I'm looping through the labels, and then I also uh, um, translate it. So I created another method called do translate, where I pass in the, the label, the English label, and I will translate it to uh, Dutch. I get the description, I get the score, the confidence, and then I uh, apply it to, uh, to the object. For logos, I do the same. I did the same for web entities. Uh, look. You can see here this image that detect faces. Image in this case is uh, just the path, the, the the image from the from the bucket. Yeah. Here you can see the translate text. I say translate client and then dot translate. I pass in the t the label, and then uh, the language, the out output language that I want to have. So in this case, I hard coded it to uh, an L, but uh, yeah, that can be uh, one of the hundreds languages. And here you see the, the video um, API call. I say a video client and then annotate the video. For the beta version, it only takes the, um, the bucket path, but eventually you will be also able to upload it and maybe even do the streaming because streaming works for audio. So I assume that will probably be uh, like that in the future. Yeah. It gives me back, well, this time it will take a while because you need to process the whole video. It first needs to do a full run to go through all the frames. And once it comes back, then I can uh, loop through all the labels and I can also loop through all the timestamps. And I get that back. Now, the last thing that I did is I just push it on, uh, with Jinja on, uh, on an HTML page. I show the video and then I loop through all the, the labels and timestamps to, to show it. And, uh, same is for uh, Vision API. Right. Mm. 
Yeah, I can, uh, I can get in between, I can tell you already where Google is using these uh, magic for. Uh, we use it, for example, for Gmail. Uh, we have uh, nowadays smart reply in, in Gmail, so when you get like a message, you can, uh, you could say, um, you get an email message and you hit reply, then it comes back with a message that could be a possible answer. Um, we do spam, uh, uh, yeah, flagging of spam is all done with machine learning. Um, what, what else? Uh, like uh, recommendations in YouTube, uh, translation, uh, the translation app in, in, in Google is uh, all, uh, yeah, machine learning. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to show. Back to Dimitri, he's going to show some other cool demos. That's actually going to be interesting because I rely heavily on slides right now, and with the performance which, which we just see, which, which we just seen, it may delay us into drinks, but we'll work on getting through. Okay, so the second example that I will do has to do with the parallel data processing and also a bit of machine learning. So in the case with Lee, it was the web application, it was the usage of ML APIs. Now let's take a look at the example that someone told me was already presented today on the conference, so it will be interesting. We will take the uh, data set from MNIST. I'm very bad with abbreviations. And what this data set pretty much has is it has the codified images of the handwriting. So every line in this data set is the key of the uh, like is the key of the symbol, and the codified uh, description like of a 28 x 28 matrix of what's what kind of symbol this is. So you see you see on the example like. What am I getting here? Uh, the, my favorite part about this is that you can actually do it at home in 25 minutes. So you will need 10 minutes to set it up in uh, Google Cloud, and you will need 15, 15 <laughs> minutes to run it on uh, the Google Cloud using the scripts that Solution Guide is giving you. So if anyone tries to do it at home, completely safe, go ahead. That's also one of the reasons why I will not be running it here, because it's 25 minutes. So, um, yeah, I will want to do the recognition of the uh, contents on the data set like this. Uh, I will use a pre-trained tra TensorFlow model, and I will want to do it on a large scale. So obviously I don't want to run it on a single machine, uh, because it will take not 25 minutes. And the solution to do that is to, uh, also I will want to store things somewhere, I will want to run them in parallel, and I will want to get the structured data representation. But I don't want to set up a Hadoop cluster, I don't want to set up uh, a database for it, I want to have everything in serverless uh, fashion. So the solution for this will be use of Dataflow. And the reason why I'm bringing up Dataflow here today is that recently the Python SDK for it went GA. Yay! I was on a training for Dataflow about six months ago, and back then we didn't have Python SDK, there was only Java SDK, and it drove me nuts. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is Dataflow? Dataflow is a unified programming model for batch and stream data processing. So everything that you can run on parallel, like embarrassing the parallel workloads, uh, MapReduce-like operations, uh, stuff that you need to like pretty much break down one, one large chunk of data and do some calculations in it in parallel, uh, Dataflow is very well su suited for it. Uh, here on the example, we will actually use data flow to feed the machine learning data, uh, with the machine learning model with the data and process the results from it. Uh, why I personally like it is because it allows me to do things similar to which I would need a Hadoop cluster and some additional knowledge. Here it's enough just to have Python knowledge and be able to use the basic SDK. SDK allows you to do three key things process the data, process the arguments, define the logic of how you want to process, uh, like read the arguments, define the logic how you want to process each line of the arguments or each ch chunk of the arguments, and then explain what will you do with the outputs as soon as uh, the processing is done. And the SDK is, uh, is actually an open source project right now, it's Apache Beam. Uh, what Google Cloud Dataflow is, is the cloud service which allows you to run it at scale. So you can develop your data flow pipelines uh, locally on your machine and then put it into Google Cloud to run it on the infrastructure, which will actually make it not in hours, but in minutes. Uh, yeah, on the left there is an example of the pipeline, but we will show, I will show more of it in a couple of seconds. So uh, this is the architecture that you will get if you will follow this solution guide. Uh, on the left and on the right side you see the parts which have been missing up until now is the storage both for your unstructured data and structured data. So on the left side you see cloud storage, that's the Google's um, 
addition of uh, object storage service where you can put any data into the cloud and then work, work with it through the data flow, through the cloud machine learning, through anything. On the top of it, you see uh, data flow. Uh, with the icon of Beam on the right and Python on the left. Uh, why so? Because all the logic which, which is used in this solution guide, besides the pre-trained TensorFlow model, is written in Python. You will see it soon. Uh, so below you see the pre-trained ma uh, machine learning model. Uh, on the right you see a little icon of the brain. That's the service called ML Engine. That's the Google's uh, offering for training machine learning models at scale. Assuming that they have a lot of data, assuming that you have an ML, ML, ML expert uh, in uh, house, and you don't want to build your own cluster to train the machine learning uh, uh, model for yourself, Google can help with this. And on the right, you see the BigQuery. BigQuery is our data warehouse product, which allows you to store the structured data which you can query with SQL, uh, very cost efficiently, very fast, uh, very easy to use. Uh, actually, most of the BigQuery users who I know, uh, they are usually staying within the free tier. So they store the, uh, quite big databases in uh, BigQuery uh, from their applications and very rarely actually go outside of the free tier. And just to add a little bit of eye candy, uh, eye candy on top of it is the data studio, the product that can, you can put into a BigQuery and write nice dashboards based on the data that you have in BigQuery. OK, so let's take a look at the Python part in the data flow. There are three simple steps that are happening here. One is we will import the TensorFlow model that will, get, uh, that will eventually get into all the nodes that DataFlow will use to process the large uh, set of data that we have for the recognition. Two, for every, uh, we will specify the DoFM class. That's from the Apache Beam SDK. Uh, that will pretty much explain that for each set of arguments that uh, will be passed into the data processing pipeline, uh, we'll have to run it through the machine learning model and get the prediction. So what sort of symbol is this? And three, uh, we will need to initialize the Beam pipeline. Uh, we'll need to read the inputs from BigQuery in this example or from the cloud storage. And we'll need to uh, execute the Pardo uh, transform for, all the, uh, for each item that uh, was uh, read from the input data. Now what's important is that when you will run this solution guide, hopefully someone will run it uh, in, your, uh, in your own uh, Google Cloud project, uh, you will be able to specify the number of workers. Uh, my top number was five workers, and I got to 15 minutes of the processing. Uh, I tried to do more, but I never got to the five minutes. So what it means is that the pipelines that you see here, either uh, processing the data from the cloud storage or processing the data from uh, BigQuery. Oh, actually, the signs are wrong. The, that's the BigQuery, and that's the cloud storage. Uh, they run in parallel. So again, imagine that you have some sort of uh, Hadoop-like system that does the parallel calculations for you, but you don't have to provision any infrastructure, and the only code and the only scripting that you, that you did was on the Python to express how to read the data, how to put it into a machine learning model, and how to uh, stream the outputs either into cloud storage or into BigQuery. Quite straightforward, not zero operations involved, actually, and uh, you get into the situation when you don't have a pre-trained model and you don't have the infrastructure, but suddenly you're doing machine learning. That's quite cool. Outputs. Uh, with the outputs from it, you get, uh, with this solution guide and with most of the solutions like that, uh, you get the data structure in a structured form into BigQuery. So you can later query it with SQL. Uh, you can hook up Data Studio to it, and you can do the visuals, like do the analytics of uh, how much of which symbols you have here. In this particular example, each column means the probability with which a uh, machine learning model considers that this line, this symbol, was 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, OK, so uh, back to the original task. Large set of data. We process it in parallel. Uh, custom build TensorFlow and custom trade TensorFlow model. Uh, we integrate it very nicely using Apache Beam SDK. And no boilerplate code to read the data, to put it into TensorFlow, to put it into the BigQuery. So everything is a part of the SDK. And no infrastructure needed. So cloud storage, data flow, BigQuery, it's all in place. You can use it as an on-demand service. Uh, yeah, so we're not running this on stage, but the deck has uh, links to GitHub and to Solution Guide, so feel free to practice it yourself. This is quite cool and quite useful. That's it. Do we have time for questions?
Thank you very much. Yes, there's certainly time for some questions. So if there's anybody in the audience that would like to ask a question, then raise your hand. Guess there. Yeah, we are the last, uh, the last border between you guys and beers. So we'll understand if you will ask questions over beers. <laughs> so it's a tough decision. Yeah. In that case, I would like to thank you for your excellent talk. Um, I have a couple of excellent So thank you very much for your talk. Thank You're you very welcome. Much. Yes, very much. Give it was fun. One final Thank you, guys. Thank you.